Richard Buckminster Fuller, July 12, 1895 to July 1, 1983, was an American architect, systems theorist, author, designer, inventor, and futurist. Fuller published more than 30 books, coining or popularizing terms such as spaceship Earth, Dimaxion, house, car, ephemeralization, synergetic, and tensor gritty. He also developed numerous inventions, mainly architectural designs, and popularized the widely known geodesic dome. Carbon molecules known as fullerenes were later named by scientists for their structural and mathematical resemblance to geodesic spheres. Fuller was the second world president of Mensa from 1974 to 1983. Life and work Fuller was born on July 12, 1895, in Milton, Massachusetts, the son of Richard Buckminster Fuller and Caroline Walcott Andrews, and grand-nephew of Margaret Fuller, an American journalist, critic, and women's rights advocate associated with the American transcendentalism movement. The unusual middle name, Buckminster, was an ancestral family name. As a child, Richard Buckminster Fuller tried numerous variations of his name. He used to sign his name differently each year in the guest register of his family summer vacation home at Bear Island, Maine. He finally settled on R. Buckminster Fuller. Fuller spent much of his youth on Bear Island, in Penobscot Bay off the coast of Maine. He attended Frobelian Kindergarten. He disagreed with the way geometry was taught in school, being unable to experience for himself that a chalk dot on the blackboard represented an empty mathematical point, or that a line could stretch off to infinity. To him these were illogical, and led to his work on synergetics. He often made items from materials he found in the woods, and sometimes made his own tools. He experimented with designing a new apparatus for human propulsion of small boats. By age 12, he had invented a push-pull system for propelling a rowboat by use of an inverted umbrella connected to the transom with a simple oar lock which allowed the user to face forward to point the boat toward its destination. Later in life, Fuller took exception to the term, invention. Years later, he decided that this sort of experience had provided him with not only an interest in design, but also a habit of being familiar with and knowledgeable about the materials that his later projects would require. Fuller earned a machinist certification, and knew how to use the press brake, stretch press, and other tools and equipment used in the sheet metal trade. Education. <inaudible> <inaudible> Fuller attended Milton Academy in Massachusetts, and after that began studying at Harvard College, where he was affiliated with Adams House. He was expelled from Harvard twice, first for spending all his money partying with a vaudeville troupe, and then, after having been readmitted, for his irresponsibility and lack of interest. By his own appraisal, he was a non-conforming misfit in the fraternity environment. Topic. Wartime experience Between his sessions at Harvard, Fuller worked in Canada as a mechanic in a textile mill, and later as a laborer in the meat packing industry. He also served in the U.S. Navy in World War I, as a shipboard radio operator, as an editor of a publication, and as a crash rescue boat commander. After discharge, he worked again in the meatpacking industry, acquiring management experience. In 1917, he married Ann Hewlett. During the early 1920s, he and his father-in-law developed the stockade building system for producing lightweight, weatherproof, and fireproof housing—although the company would ultimately fail in 1927. Depression and Epiphany Buckminster Fuller recalled 1927 as a pivotal year of his life. His daughter Alexandra had died in 1922 of complications from polio and spinal meningitis just before her fourth birthday. Stanford historian, Barry Katz, found signs that around this time in his life Fuller was suffering from depression and anxiety. 
Fuller dwelled on his daughter's death, suspecting that it was connected with the Fuller's damp and drafty living conditions. This provided motivation for Fuller's involvement in stockade building systems, a business which aimed to provide affordable, efficient housing. In 1927, at age 32, Fuller lost his job as president of Stockade. The Fuller family had no savings, and the birth of their daughter Allegra in 1927 added to the financial challenges. Fuller drank heavily and reflected upon the solution to his family's struggles on long walks around Chicago. During the autumn of 1927, Fuller contemplated suicide by drowning in Lake Michigan, so that his family could benefit from a life insurance payment. Fuller said that he had experienced a profound incident which would provide direction and purpose for his life. He felt as though he was suspended several feet above the ground enclosed in a white sphere of light. A voice spoke directly to Fuller, and declared, From now on you need never awake temporal attestation to your thought. You think the truth. You do not have the right to eliminate yourself. You do not belong to you. You belong to universe. Your significance will remain forever obscure to you, but you may assume that you are fulfilling your role if you apply yourself to converting your experiences to the highest advantage of others. Fuller stated that this experience led to a profound re-examination of his life. He ultimately chose to embark on an experiment, to find what a single individual could contribute to changing the world and benefiting all humanity. Speaking to audiences later in life, Fuller would regularly recount the story of his Lake Michigan experience, and its transformative impact on his life. Historians have been unable to identify direct evidence for this experience within the 1927 papers of Fuller's Chronophile Archives, housed at Stanford University. Stanford historian Barry Katz suggests that the suicide story may be a myth which Fuller constructed later in life, to summarize this formative period of his career. Recovery <inaudible> 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 In 1927 Fuller resolved to think independently which included a commitment to the search for the principles governing the universe and help advance the evolution of humanity in accordance with them. Finding ways of doing more with less to the end that all people everywhere can have more and more. By 1928, Fuller was living in Greenwich Village and spending much of his time at the popular café Romany Marie's, where he had spent an evening in conversation with Marie and Eugene O'Neill several years earlier. Fuller accepted a job decorating the interior of the café in exchange for meals, giving informal lectures several times a week, and models of the Dymaxion House were exhibited at the café. Isamu Noguchi arrived during 1929. Constantin Brancusi, an old friend of Marie's, had directed him there, and Noguchi and Fuller were soon collaborating on several projects, including the modeling of the Dymaxion car based on recent work by Aurel Pasu. It was the beginning of their lifelong friendship. Geodesic <laughs> domes <laughs> 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 Fuller taught at Black Mountain College in North Carolina during the summers of 1948 and 1949, serving as its Summer Institute Director in 1949. There, with the support of a group of professors and students, he began reinventing a project that would make him famous, the Geodesic Dome. Although the Geodesic Dome had been created 26 years earlier by Dr. Walter Bowersfield, Fuller was awarded United States patents, even though he neglected to cite Bowersfield's prior art in his patent applications. He is credited for popularizing this type of structure. One of his early models was first constructed in 1945 at Bennington College in Vermont, where he lectured often. In 1949, he erected his first geodesic dome building that could sustain its own weight with no practical limits. It was 4.3 meters 14 feet in diameter and constructed of aluminium aircraft tubing and a vinyl plastic skin, in the form of an icosahedron. To prove his design, Fuller suspended from the structure's framework several students who had helped him build it. The U.S. government recognized the importance of his work, and employed his firm Geodesics, Inc. in Raleigh, North Carolina to make small domes for the Marines. 
Within a few years, there were thousands of such domes around the world. Fuller's first, "...continuous tension, discontinuous compression." Geodesic dome full sphere in this case was constructed at the University of Oregon Architecture School in 1959 with the help of students. These continuous tension, discontinuous compression structures featured single force compression members no flexure or bending moments that did not touch each other and were suspended by the tensional members. Dymaxion chronophile For half of a century, Fuller developed many ideas, designs and inventions, particularly regarding practical, inexpensive shelter and transportation. He documented his life, philosophy and ideas scrupulously by a daily diary later called the Dymaxion Chronophile, and by 28 publications. Fuller financed some of his experiments with inherited funds, sometimes augmented by funds invested by his collaborators, one example being the Dymaxion Car Project. Topic world stage International recognition began with the success of huge geodesic domes during the 1950s. Fuller lectured at North Carolina State University in Raleigh in 1949, where he met James Fitzgibbon, who would become a close friend and colleague. Fitzgibbon was director of Geodesics, Inc. and Synergetics, Inc. the first licensees to design geodesic domes. Thomas C. Howard was lead designer, architect and engineer for both companies. Richard Lewontin, a new faculty member in population genetics at North Carolina State University, provided Fuller with computer calculations for the lengths of the dome's edges. Fuller began working with architect Shoji Sadao in 1954, and in 1964 they co founded the architectural firm Fuller and Sadao Inc., whose first project was to design the large geodesic dome for the U.S. Pavilion at Expo 67 in Montreal. This building is now the Montreal Biosphere. In 1962, the artist and searcher John McHale wrote the first monograph on Fuller, published by George Brazilla in New York. From 1959 to 1970, Fuller taught at Southern Illinois University Carbondale SHU. Beginning as an assistant professor, he gained full professorship in 1968, in the School of Art and Design. Working as a designer, scientist, developer, and writer, he lectured for many years around the world. He collaborated at SHU with John McHale. In 1965, they inaugurated the World Design Science Decade 1965 at the meeting of the International Union of Architects in Paris, which was, in Fuller's own words, devoted to applying the principles of science to solving the problems of humanity. Later in his shoe tenure, Fuller was also a visiting professor at Shoe Edwardsville, where he designed the dome for the campus religious center. Fuller believed human societies would soon rely mainly on renewable sources of energy, such as solar and wind derived electricity. He hoped for an age of omni successful education and sustenance of all humanity. Fuller referred to himself as the property of universe and during one radio interview he gave later in life, declared himself and his work the property of all humanity. For his lifetime of work, the American Humanist Association named him the 1969 Humanist of the Year. In 1976, Fuller was a key participant at UN Habitat I, the first UN forum on human settlements. Topic. Honors Fuller was awarded 28 United States patents and many honorary doctorates. In 1960, he was awarded the Frank P. Brown Medal from the Franklin Institute. Fuller was elected as an honorary member of Phi Beta Kappa in 1967, on the occasion of the 50th year reunion of his Harvard class of 1917 from which he was expelled in his first year. He was elected a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1968. In 1968, he was elected into the National Academy of Design as an associate member, and became a full academician in 1970. In 1970, he received the Gold Medal Award from the American Institute of Architects. In 1976, he received the St. Louis Literary Award from the St. Louis University Library Associates. 
He also received numerous other awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom presented to him on February 23, 1983, by President Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Last filmed appearance Fuller's last filmed interview took place on June 21, 1983, in which he spoke at Norman Foster's Royal Gold Medal for Architecture Ceremony. His speech can be watched in the archives of the AA School of Architecture, in which he spoke after Sir Robert Sainsbury's introductory speech and Foster's keynote address. <laughs> Death Fuller died on July 1, 1983, 11 days before his 88th birthday. During the period leading up to his death, his wife had been lying comatose in a Los Angeles hospital, dying of cancer. It was while visiting her there that he exclaimed, at a certain point, She is squeezing my hand. He then stood up, suffered a heart attack, and died an hour later, at age 87. His wife of 66 years died 36 hours later. They are buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Topic: Philosophy and worldview. Buckminster Fuller was a Unitarian, like his grandfather Arthur Buckminster Fuller, a Unitarian minister. Fuller was also an early environmental activist, aware of the Earth's finite resources, and promoted a principle he termed ephemeralization, which, according to futurist and Fuller disciple Stuart Brand, was defined as doing more with less. Resources and waste from crude, inefficient products could be recycled into making more valuable products, thus increasing the efficiency of the entire process. Fuller also coined the word synergetics, a catch-all term used broadly for communicating experiences using geometric concepts, and more specifically, the empirical study of systems in transformation. His focus was on total system behavior unpredicted by the behavior of any isolated components. Fuller was a pioneer in thinking globally, and explored energy and material efficiency in the fields of architecture, engineering and design. Citing François de Chardonnay's opinion that petroleum, from the standpoint of its replacement cost in our current energy budget, essentially, the net incoming solar flux, had cost nature over a million dollars per U.S. gallon 300,000 United States dollars per liter to produce. From this point of view, its use as a transportation fuel by people commuting to work represents a huge net loss compared to their actual earnings. An encapsulation quotation of his views might best be summed up as, There is no energy crisis, only a crisis of ignorance. Though Fuller was concerned about sustainability and human survival under the existing socio-economic system, he remained optimistic about humanity's future. Defining wealth in terms of knowledge, as the technological ability to protect, nurture, support, and accommodate all growth needs of life. His analysis of the condition of spaceship Earth caused him to conclude that at a certain time during the 1970s, humanity had attained an unprecedented state. He was convinced that the accumulation of relevant knowledge, combined with the quantities of major recyclable resources that had already been extracted from the Earth, had attained a critical level, such that competition for necessities had become unnecessary. Cooperation had become the optimum survival strategy. He declared, "...selfishness is unnecessary and henceforth unrationalizable. War is obsolete." He criticized previous utopian schemes as too exclusive, and thought this was a major source of their failure. To work, he thought that a utopia needed to include everyone. Fuller was influenced by Alfred Kozybski's idea of general semantics. In the 1950s, Fuller attended seminars and workshops organized by the Institute of General Semantics, and he delivered the annual Alfred Kozybski Memorial Lecture in 1955. Kozybski is mentioned in the introduction of his book Synergetics. The two shared a remarkable amount of similarity in their formulations of general semantics. In his 1970 book I Seem to Be a Verb, he wrote, 
I live on earth at present, and I don't know what I am. I know that I am not a category. I am not a thing. A noun. I seem to be a verb, an evolutionary process. An integral function of the universe. Fuller wrote that the natural analytic geometry of the universe was based on arrays of tetrahedra. He developed this in several ways, from the close packing of spheres and the number of compressive or tensile members required to stabilize an object in space. One confirming result was that the strongest possible homogeneous truss is cyclically tetrahedral. He had become a guru of the design, architecture, and alternative communities, such as Drop City, the community of experimental artists to whom he awarded the 1966 Dimaxian Award for poetically economic domed living structures. Topic: <laughs> Major design projects. The geodesic dome Fuller was most famous for his lattice shell structures, geodesic domes, which have been used as parts of military radar stations, civic buildings, environmental protest camps and exhibition attractions. An examination of the geodesic design by Walter Bowersfield for the Zeiss Planetarium, built some 28 years prior to Fuller's work, reveals that Fuller's geodesic dome patent US 2,682,235, awarded in 1954, is the same design as Bowersfeld's. Their construction is based on extending some basic principles to build simple tensor gritty structures, tetrahedron, octahedron, and the closest packing of spheres, making them lightweight and stable. The geodesic dome was a result of Fuller's exploration of nature's constructing principles to find design solutions. The Fuller Dome is referenced in the Hugo Award-winning novel Stand on Zanzibar by John Brunner, in which a geodesic dome is said to cover the entire island of Manhattan, and it floats on air due to the hot air balloon effect of the large air mass under the dome and perhaps its construction of lightweight materials. <laughs> Transportation The Dymaxion car was a vehicle designed by Fuller, featured prominently at Chicago's 1933–1934 Century of Progress World's Fair. During the Great Depression, Fuller formed the Dymaxion Corporation and built three prototypes with noted naval architect Starling Burgess and a team of 27 workmen—using donated money as well as a family inheritance, Fuller associated the word Dymaxion with much of his work, a portmanteau of the words dynamic, maximum, and tension to sum up the goal of his study, maximum gain of advantage from minimal energy input. The Dymaxion was not an automobile per se, but rather the ground taxiing mode of a vehicle that might one day be designed to fly, land and drive, an omni-medium transport for air, land and water. Fuller focused on the landing and taxiing qualities, and noted severe limitations in its handling. The team made constant improvements and refinements to the platform, and Fuller noted the Dymaxion was an invention that could not be made available to the general public without considerable improvements. The bodywork was aerodynamically designed for increased fuel efficiency and speed as well as lightweight, and its platform featured a lightweight chromoly steel hinged chassis, rear-mounted V8 engine, front drive and three wheels. The vehicle was steered via the third wheel at the rear, capable of 90 degrees steering lock. Thus able to steer in a tight circle, the Dymaxion often caused a sensation, bringing nearby traffic to a halt. Shortly after launch, a prototype crashed after being hit by another car, killing the Dymaxion's driver. The other car was driven by a local politician and was illegally removed from the accident scene, leaving reporters who arrived subsequently to blame the Dymaxion's unconventional design. Though investigations exonerated the prototype. Fuller would himself later crash another prototype with his young daughter aboard. Despite courting the interest of important figures from the auto industry, Fuller used his family inheritance to finish the second and third prototypes. 
eventually selling all three, dissolving Dymaxion Corporation and maintaining the Dymaxion was never intended as a commercial venture. One of the three original prototypes survives. Housing Fuller's energy-efficient and inexpensive Dymaxion house garnered much interest, but only two prototypes were ever produced. Here the term, Dymaxion, is used in effect to signify a radically strong and light tensegrity structure. One of Fuller's Dymaxion houses is on display as a permanent exhibit at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Designed and developed during the mid-1940s, this prototype is a round structure not a dome, shaped something like the flattened bell of certain jellyfish. It has several innovative features, including revolving dresser drawers, and a fine mist shower that reduces water consumption. According to Fuller biographer Steve Crooks, the house was designed to be delivered in two cylindrical packages, with interior color panels available at local dealers. A circular structure at the top of the house was designed to rotate around a central mast to use natural winds for cooling and air circulation. Conceived nearly two decades earlier, and developed in Wichita, Kansas, the house was designed to be lightweight, adapted to windy climates, cheap to produce and easy to assemble. Because of its lightweight and portability, the Dymaxion house was intended to be the ideal housing for individuals and families who wanted the option of easy mobility. The design included a go-ahead-with-life room, stocked with maps, charts, and helpful tools for travel through time and space. It was to be produced using factories, workers, and technologies that had produced World War II aircraft. It looked ultramodern at the time, built of metal, and sheathed in polished aluminum. The basic model enclosed 90 square meters 970 square feet of floor area. Due to publicity, there were many orders during the early post-war years, but the company that Fuller and others had formed to produce the houses failed due to management problems. In 1967, Fuller developed a concept for an offshore floating city named Triton City and published a report on the design the following year. Models of the city aroused the interest of President Lyndon B. Johnson who, after leaving office, had them placed in the Lyndon Baines Johnson Library and Museum. In 1969, Fuller began the Otisco Project, named after its location in Otisco, New York. The project developed and demonstrated concrete spray with mesh-covered wireforms for producing large-scale, load-bearing spanning structures built on site, without the use of pouring molds, other adjacent surfaces or hoisting. The initial method used a circular concrete footing in which anchor posts were set. Tubes cut to length and with ends flattened were then bolted together to form a duodecerombicohedron 22-sided hemisphere geodesic structure with spans ranging to 60 feet 18 meters. The form was then draped with layers of one quarter inch wire mesh attached by twist ties. Concrete was sprayed onto the structure, building up a solid layer which, when cured, would support additional concrete to be added by a variety of traditional means. Fuller referred to these buildings as monolithic ferroconcrete geodesic domes. However, the tubular frame form proved problematic for setting windows and doors. It was replaced by an iron rebar set vertically in the concrete footing and then bent inward and welded in place to create the dome's wireform structure and performed satisfactorily. Domes up to three stories tall built with this method proved to be remarkably strong. Other shapes such as cones, pyramids and arches proved equally adaptable. The project was enabled by a grant underwritten by Syracuse University and sponsored by U.S. Steel Rebar, the Johnson Wire Corp., Mesh and Portland Cement Company Concrete. The ability to build large complex load-bearing concrete spanning structures in free space would open many possibilities in architecture, and is considered as one of Fuller's greatest contributions. Dymaxion map and world game Fuller, along with co-cartographer Shoji Sadao, also designed an alternative projection map, called the Dymaxion map. 
This was designed to show Earth's continents with minimum distortion when projected or printed on a flat surface. In the 1960s, Fuller developed the World Game, a collaborative simulation game played on a 70 by 35 foot Dymaxion map, in which players attempt to solve world problems. The object of the simulation game is, in Fuller's words, to make the world work, for 100% of humanity, in the shortest possible time, through spontaneous cooperation, without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. Topic. Appearance and style Buckminster Fuller wore thick-lensed spectacles to correct his extreme hyperopia, a condition that went undiagnosed for the first five years of his life. Fuller's hearing was damaged during his naval service in World War I and deteriorated during the 1960s. After experimenting with bullhorns as hearing aids during the mid-1960s, Fuller adopted electronic hearing aids from the 1970s onward. In public appearances, Fuller always wore dark-colored suits, appearing like an alert little clergyman. Previously, he had experimented with unconventional clothing immediately after his 1927 epiphany, but found that breaking social fashion customs made others devalue or dismiss his ideas. Fuller learned the importance of physical appearance as part of one's credibility, and decided to become the Invisible Man by dressing in clothes that would not draw attention to himself. With self-deprecating humor, Fuller described this black-suited appearance as resembling a second-rate bank clerk. Writer Guy Davenport met him in 1965 and described him thus, He's a dwarf, with a worker's hands, all calluses and squared fingers. He carries an ear trumpet, of green plastic, with World Series 1965 printed on it. His smile is golden and frequent, the man's temperament is angelic, and his energy is just a touch more than that of Robert Galway, champion runner, footballer, and swimmer. One leg is shorter than the other, and the prescription shoe worn to correct the imbalance comes from a country doctor deep in the wilderness of Maine. Blue blazer, Khrushchev trousers, and a briefcase full of Japanese made wonderments. Topic <laughs> Quirks Following his global prominence from the 1960s onward, Fuller became a frequent flyer, often crossing time zones to lecture. In the 1960s and 1970s, he wore three watches simultaneously, one for the time zone of his office in Carbondale, one for the time zone of the location he would next visit, and one for the time zone he was currently in. In the 1970s, Fuller was only in homely locations, his personal home in Carbondale, Illinois, his holiday retreat in Bear Island, Maine, his daughter's home in Pacific Palisades, California roughly 65 nights per year. The other 300 nights were spent in hotel beds in the locations he visited on his lecturing and consulting circuits. In the 1920s, Fuller experimented with polyphasic sleep, which he called Dymaxion sleep. Inspired by the sleep habits of animals such as dogs and cats, Fuller worked until he was tired, and then slept short naps. This generally resulted in Fuller sleeping 30 minute naps every six hours. This allowed him 22 thinking hours a day, which aided his work productivity. Fuller reportedly kept this Dymaxion sleep habit for two years, before quitting the routine because it conflicted with his business associate's sleep habits. Despite no longer personally partaking in the habit, in 1943 Fuller suggested Dymaxion sleep as a strategy that the United States could adopt to win World War II. Despite only practicing true polyphasic sleep for a period during the 1920s, Fuller was known for his stamina throughout his life. He was described as tireless by Barry Farrell in Life magazine, who noted that Fuller stayed up all night replying to mail during Farrell's 1970 trip to Bear Island. In his 70s, Fuller generally slept for five to eight hours per night. Fuller documented his life copiously from 1915 to 1983, approximately 270 feet 82 meters of papers in a collection called the Dymaxion Chronophile. He also kept copies of all incoming and outgoing correspondence. 
The enormous Fuller collection is currently housed at Stanford University. If somebody kept a very accurate record of a human being, going through the era from the gay 90s, from a very different kind of world through the turn of the century, as far into the 20th century as you might live. I decided to make myself a good case history of such a human being and it meant that I could not be judge of what was valid to put in or not. I must put everything in, so I started a very rigorous record. In his youth, Fuller experimented with several ways of presenting himself, R. B. Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, but as an adult finally settled on R. Buckminster Fuller, and signed his letters as such. However, he preferred to be addressed as simply, Bucky. Topic. Language and neologisms Buckminster Fuller spoke and wrote in a unique style and said it was important to describe the world as accurately as possible. Fuller often created long run on sentences and used unusual compound words omni well informed, inter transformative, omni inter accommodative, omni self regenerative as well as terms he himself invented. Fuller used the word universe without the definite or indefinite articles the aura and always capitalized the word. Fuller wrote that by universe I mean, the aggregate of all humanities consciously apprehended and communicated to self or others experiences. The words, down, and up, according to Fuller, are awkward in that they refer to a planar concept of direction inconsistent with human experience. The words, in, and out, should be used instead, he argued, because they better describe an object's relation to a gravitational center, the Earth. I suggest to audiences that they say, I'm going outstairs, and in stairs. At first that sounds strange to them, they all laugh about it. But if they try saying in and out for a few days in fun, they find themselves beginning to realize that they are indeed going inward and outward in respect to the center of Earth, which is our spaceship Earth. And for the first time they begin to feel real reality. World around is a term coined by Fuller to replace worldwide. The general belief in a flat earth died out in classical antiquity, so using wide is an anachronism when referring to the surface of the earth. A spheroidal surface has area and encloses a volume but has no width. Fuller held that unthinking use of obsolete scientific ideas detracts from and misleads intuition. Other neologisms collectively invented by the Fuller family, according to Allegra Fuller Snyder, are the terms sunsight and sunclips, replacing sunrise and sunset to overturn the geocentric bias of most pre-Copernican celestial mechanics. Fuller also invented the word livingry as opposed to weaponry or killingry to mean that which is in support of all human, plant, and earth life. The architectural profession civil, naval, aeronautical, and astronautical—has always been the place where the most competent thinking is conducted regarding livingry, as opposed to weaponry." As well as contributing significantly to the development of tensegrity technology, Fuller invented the term, tensegrity, a portmanteau of tensional integrity. Tensegrity describes a structural relationship principle in which structural shape is guaranteed by the finitely closed, comprehensively continuous, tensional behaviors of the system and not by the discontinuous and exclusively local compressional member behaviors. Tensegrity provides the ability to yield increasingly without ultimately breaking or coming asunder. Quote, quote, Dimaxion is a portmanteau of dynamic maximum tension. Quote, dot, it was invented around 1929 by two ad men at Marshall Field's department store in Chicago to describe Fuller's concept house, which was shown as part of a House of the Future store display. They created the term utilizing three words that Fuller used repeatedly to describe his design, dynamic, maximum, and tension. Fuller also helped to popularize the concept of spaceship Earth. 
the most important fact about Spaceship Earth, an instruction manual didn't come with it. Topic: <laughs> Concepts and Buildings. His concepts and buildings include Topic influence and legacy Among the many people who were influenced by Buckminster Fuller are, Constance Abernathy, Ruth Asawa, J. Baldwin, Michael Ben Eli, Pierre Cabral, John Cage, Joseph Clinton, Peter Floyd, Medard Gabel, Michael Hayes, Ted Nelson, David Johnston, Peter John Pierce, Shoji Sadow, Edwin Schlossberg, Kenneth Snelson, Robert Anton Wilson and Stuart Brand, an allotrope of carbon, fullerene, and a particular molecule of that allotrope C60, Buckminster fullerene or buckyball has been named after him. The Buckminster fullerene molecule, which consists of 60 carbon atoms, very closely resembles a spherical version of Fuller's geodesic dome. The 1996 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given to Croto, Curl, and Smalley for their discovery of the fullerene. He is quoted in the lyric of The Tower of Babel in the musical Godspell. Man is a complex of patterns and processes. The indie band Driftless Pony Club named their 2011 album, Buckminster, after him. All the songs within the album are based upon his life and works. On July 12, 2004, the United States Post Office released a new commemorative stamp honoring R. Buckminster Fuller on the 50th anniversary of his patent for the geodesic dome and by the occasion of his 109th birthday. The stamp's design replicated the January 10, 1964 cover of Time magazine. Fuller was the subject of two documentary films, The World of Buckminster Fuller 1971 and Buckminster Fuller, Thinking Out Loud 1996. Additionally, filmmaker Sam Green and the band Yola Tengo collaborated on a 2012 live documentary about Fuller, the love song of R. Buckminster Fuller. In June 2008, the Whitney Museum of American Art presented Buckminster Fuller, starting with the universe, the most comprehensive retrospective to date of his work and ideas. The exhibition traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago in 2009. It presented a combination of models, sketches, and other artifacts, representing six decades of the artist's integrated approach to housing, transportation, communication, and cartography. It also featured the extensive connections with Chicago from his years spent living, teaching, and working in the city. In 2009, a number of U.S. companies decided to repackage spherical magnets and sell them as toys. One company, Maxfield & Oberton, told the New York Times that they saw the product on YouTube and decided to repackage them as buckyballs, because the magnets could self-form and hold together in shapes reminiscent of the Fuller-inspired buckyballs. The buckyball toy launched at New York International Gift Fair in 2009 and sold in the hundreds of thousands, but by 2010 began to experience problems with toy safety issues and the company was forced to recall the packages that were labeled as toys. Robert Kiyosaki's 2015 book Second Chance is largely about Kiyosaki's interactions with Fuller, and Fuller's unusual final book Grunch of Giants. In 2012, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art hosted The Utopian Impulse, a show about Buckman. Mr. Fuller's influence in the Bay Area. Featured were concepts, inventions and designs for creating free energy from natural forces, and for sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. The show ran January through July. In a different note, Fuller's quote, those who play with the devil's toys, will be brought by degree to wield his sword, was used and referenced as the first display seen in the strategy sci-fi video game XCOM, Enemy Within developed by Firaxis Games. The House of Tomorrow, is a 2017 American independent drama film written and directed by Peter Livelsey, based on Peter Bognani's 2010 novel of the same name, featuring Asa Butterfield, Alex Wolfe, Nick Offerman, Maud Apatow, and Ellen Burstyn. Burstyn's character is obsessed by all things Buckminster Fuller providing retro-futurist tours of her geodesic home, including authentic video of Buckminster Fuller talking and sailing with Ellen Burstyn, who'd actually befriended him in real life. Patents From the Table of Contents of Inventions, the patented works of R. Buckminster Fuller 1983, ISBN 0-312-43477-4 
1927 U.S. Patent 1,633,702 Stockade, Building Structure 1927 U.S. Patent 1,634,900 Stockade, Pneumatic Forming Process 1928 Application Abandoned 4D House 1937 U.S. Patent 2,101,057 Dimaxion Car 1940 U.S. Patent 2,220,482 Dimaxion Bathroom 1944 U.S. Patent 2,343,764 Dimaxion Deployment Unit Sheet 1944 U.S. Patent 2,351,419 Dimaxion Deployment Unit Frame 1946 U.S. Patent 2,393,676 Dimaxion Map 1946 No Patent Dimaxion House Wichita 1954 U.S. Patent 2,682,235 Geodesic Dome 1959 U.S. Patent 2,881,717 Paperboard Dome 1959 U.S. Patent 2,905,113 Ply Dome 1959 U.S. Patent 2,914,074 Catenary Geodesic Tent 1961 U.S. Patent 2,986,241 Octet Truss 1962 U.S. Patent 3,063,521 Tensor Gritty 1963 U.S. Patent 3,080,583 Submarrel Undersea Island 1964 U.S. Patent 3,139,957 Aspension Suspension Building 1965 U.S. Patent 3,197,927 Monohex Geodesic Structures 1965 U.S. Patent 3,203,144 Laminar Dome 1965 Filed, No Patent Octa Spinner 1967 U.S. Patent 3,354,591 Star Tensegrity Octahedral Truss 1970 U.S. Patent 3,524,422 Rowing Needles Watercraft 1974 U.S. Patent 3,810,336 Geodesic Hexapent 1975 U.S. Patent 3,863,455 Floatable Breakwater 1975 U.S. Patent 3,866,366 Non-Symmetrical Tensegrity 1979 U.S. Patent 4,136,994 Floating Breakwater 1980 U.S. Patent 4,207,715 Tensegrity Truss 1983 U.S. Patent 4,377,114 Hanging Storage Shelf Unit Bibliography 4D Time Lock 1928 Nine Chains to the Moon 1938 Untitled Epic Poem on the History of Industrialization 1962 Ideas and Integrities A Spontaneous Autobiographical Disclosure 1963 ISBN 0-13-449140-8 No More Second Hand God and Other Writings 1963 Education Automation Freeing the Scholar to Return 1963 what I Have Learned, a collection of 20 autobiographical essays, chapter, How Little I Know, 1968 Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, 1968, ISBN 0-8093-2461-X Utopia or Oblivion, 1969, ISBN 0-553-02883-9
Approaching the Benign Environment 1970 ISBN 0 8173 with Eric A. Walker and James R. Killian, Jr. First seem to be a verb 1970 co-authors Jerome Agel, Quentin Fiore, ISBN 1-127-23153-7 Intuition 1970 Buckminster Fuller to Children of Earth 1972 compiled and photographed by Cam Smith ISBN 0-385-02979-9 The Buckminster Fuller Reader 1972 editor James Meller ISBN 9780140214345 the Dymaxion World of Buckminster Fuller 1960, 1973 co-author Robert Marx, ISBN 0-385-01804-5 Earth, Inc. 1973 ISBN 0-385-01825-8 Synergetics, Explorations in the Geometry of Thinking 1975 in collaboration with E. J. Applewhite with a preface and contribution by Arthur L. Loeb, ISBN 0-02-541870-X Tetrascroll, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, A Cosmic Fairy Tale 1975. And It Came to Pass — Not to Stay 1976, ISBN 0-02-541810-6 R. Buckminster Fuller on Education 1979, ISBN 0-87023-276-2 Synergetics 2, Further Explorations in the Geometry of Thinking 1979 in collaboration with E. J. Applewhite Buckminster Fuller, Autobiographical Monologue, Scenario 1980, page 54, R. Buckminster Fuller, documented and edited by Robert Snyder, St. Martin's Press, Inc., ISBN 0-312-10678-5 Buckminster Fuller Sketchbook 1981. Critical Path 1981, ISBN 0-312-17488-8 Grunch of Giants 1983 ISBN 0-312-35193-3 Inventions, the patented works of R. Buckminster Fuller 1983 ISBN 0-312-43477-4 Humans in Universe 1983 co-author Anwar Dill, ISBN 0-89925-001-7 Cosmography, a posthumous scenario for the future of humanity 1992 co-author Kiyoshi Kuramiya, ISBN 0-02-541850-5 See also